Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. These are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. This open article it talks about denial of basic human rights to Indian prisoners in Pakistan. Let us discuss the important aspects that are mentioned in this article. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See the issue of Indian prisoners rights who are there in Pakistan was again put into focus or spotlight by the Ramesh Taba Sosa case. See here Ramesh Taba Sosa is an Indian fisherman who was arrested by Pakistan for allegedly entering Pakistani waters without permission. He was arrested in May 2019 and subsequently sentenced and was kept in the Pakistani prison. Now in order to handle such issues in 2008 India and Pakistan signed an agreement called as Agreement on Consular Access. The agreement consists of seven provisions and one of the provisions section 4 of the agreement it states that each government shall provide consular access within 3 months to the nationals of one country under arrest, detention or imprisonment in the other country. Then section 5 or provision 5 states that both governments agree to release and repatriate persons within 1 month of confirmation of their national status and completion of sentences see here consular access is the ability of foreign nationals to have access to consulate or embassy officials of their own country in the host nation that means those indian fishermen who are now in pakistan they should be given access to indian consulate and indian officers who are posted in pakistan and here we'll also talk about a term repatriation which refers to returning someone to their own country that is india receiving back its fishermen while the seven provisions of the agreement are very promising and bilateral in nature none of these provisions of the agreement were followed with respect to ramesh taba his sentence in the pakistani prison actually ended on 3rd july of 2019 but even after his release from the prison he was not given consular access now why consular access is important see without the consular access his repatriation is not possible and as a result after years of pain and agony ramesh died in a prison hospital in karachi in pakistan on 26th march 2021 and even after his death his mortal remains are still with pakistan without being repatriated and the article reports that there is no guarantee when his family will receive mortal remains to conduct last rites and this is a grave violation of basic human rights and see mr ramesh's case is not the only case to experience these grave violations of human rights there have been many precedents related to such instances for example let us take waga chauhan case where waga chauhan is an indian fisherman who died in pakistan custody in december 2015 his mortal remains reached his village in india only after 3 4 months in april 2016 again in this case the terms of agreement on consular access were not respected or duly followed also another example is latif kasim sama case See Latif was arrested by Pakistan for trespassing into its territory. Till today he has not been given consular access as promised in the bilateral agreement on consular access. See consular access is very important without it the nationality of a person cannot be confirmed and when the nationality of a person cannot be confirmed the host nation or in this case Pakistan will consider the particular person as a terror suspect. or as an infiltrator and without confirmation of national identity the process of repatriation also cannot begin so this is the main challenge or main problem of lack of consular access now there is also a biggest drawback found in the agreement on consular access that it does not state time limit for the confirmation of national identity as a result there are numerous instances when both countries have not confirmed the nationality of prisoners even for a period around 18 months and during this time the arrested men face tremendous pressure agony mental trauma in jails again this is a grave violation of basic human rights so what should be done the author of this op-ed suggests 
revival of joint judicial committee on prisoners to solve and settle the issues see in 2007 india and pakistan set up a joint judicial committee on prisoners the committee comprised four retired judges from each side from india and also from pakistan this committee used to convene or used to meet two times in a year to meet prisoners then it made unanimous recommendations that included release of prisoners repatriation of prisoners etc see this joint judicial committee on prisoners it played a significant role in timely release and repatriations of prisoners but if you see the current status it is discontinued the last meeting of this committee was held only in 2013 that is almost 7 years back in 2018 there were efforts that were made to revive it but pakistan has yet to nominate judges or yet to call for a meeting the author believes that the revival of this committee can help innocent indian prisoners who are stuck in pakistan prison to get consular access and various other rights and finally come back to their home country india so these are some of the aspects with reference to the analysis of this article in this article we saw about the difficulty undergone by innocent indians who are now in the custody of pakistan who have failed who are not given consular access we saw about the bilateral agreement we saw the solution given by the author so as to revive joint judicial committee on prisoners now let's move on to the analysis of next news article see recently two damsel fly species were discovered in western ghats this article is related to that now let us learn about the discovery of the two damsel fly species see when we say damsel flies these are insects they are found mainly near shallow freshwater habitats they are also graceful flyers having slender bodies with long filmy net winged wings they also have stunning vivid colors they are generally smaller more delicate and they fly weakly in comparison with dragon flies yes they are similar to dragon flies but they are smaller and they have slimmer bodies than dragon flies the damsel flies are also predatory in nature that is they eat other insects now coming to the article a group of researchers from travancore nature history society and from mumbai they have recently discovered two damsel fly species in western ghats from satara district of maharashtra the new species are ipaya tosegarensis and ipaya pseudodispar they belong to the genus ipaya they are also endemic to the western ghats when we say endemic it means these are restricted in the geographical distribution of western ghats only they are found only in the western ghats Now, prior to these new discoveries only three endemic species of ipaya were known from western ghats now let us see about the original three endemic species the first endemic species is ipaya fraseri it is a very common species in the forested foothills of western ghats they are found from kanyakumari in tamil nadu to maharashtra the next endemic species is ipaya dispar it is restricted to the north of the palakkad gap from south kanara and coorg in karnataka till nilagiri in tamil nadu see kanara is a stretch of land along the arabian sea in the state of karnataka this region comprises of three districts of karnataka one is uttara kanada then udupi then dakshina kanada now let's come to the third endemic species which is ipaya cardinalis see this species is a mountain species that is they inhabit the mountainous region they are found south of palakkad gap in anamalai hills they are also found in palani and agasthyamalai hills as well now since the article mentions few geographical locations let us also see about them in brief first let's see about the palakkad gap or palghat gap it is a low mountain pass in the western ghats that is found between coimbatore in tamil nadu and palakkad in kerala then there is a mention about anamalai hills which is also known as elephant mountains see these are range of mountains that form southern portion of western ghats they span the border of tamil nadu and kerala in the southern india then coming to palani hills they are found in kerala and tamil nadu they are actually eastward extension of western ghat ranges now coming to agasthyamalai hills they are also known as ashambu hills located at the southernmost point of western ghats mountain range along the western side of south india 
Now coming to the article, with the new discoveries, we have a total of 5 endemic species of Euphaya discovered in Western Ghats. Also the newly discovered Euphaya species could have been overlooked for a long period of time or neglected for a long period of time because of their superficial similarity to other Euphaya species. When we say superficial similarity, this means similarity in physical appearances. For example, Euphaya thosagarensis is superficially similar to Euphaya cardinalis, whereas Euphaya pseudodispar is similar to Euphaya dispar. So the article states that they were overlooked or neglected for a long period of time because of the superficial similarity, however now clearly discovered. So this portrays the biological diversity that is prevailing at the Western Ghats as it is one another example of supporting the fact. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. Now this news article talks about Mr. Joseph Biden's recognition of mass killings of Armenians as an act of genocide. So in this light, let us see the background of the issue, what happened, Turkey's stand on it and the important points mentioned in the article. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. First, let's see the background so as to understand the article better. Who are the Armenians? See, they are the descendants of a branch of Indo-Europeans. They have their own culture and as an isolated population, they inhabited a region in the Near East that is bounded by Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea and Caucasus. And uh, going by the notes of history, some say that Armenia became the first nation in the world to make Christianity as its official religion. But during the 15th century AD, Armenia came into the hands of Ottoman Empire. Though the Ottoman Empire permitted the Armenians to maintain some religious autonomy, the Turks subjected them to unequal and unjust treatment. But in spite of this, the Armenian community thrived under the Ottoman rule. Then in the year 1908, a new government came into power in Turkey and this government began viewing the non-Turks, particularly the Christian non-Turks, as a grave threat to the new state. In 1914, the Turks entered World War I on the side of Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. See, already there was a suspicion that the Christian Armenians would be more loyal to Christian governments. And when the war intensified, Armenians organized volunteer battalions so as to help the Russian army to fight against the Turks in the Caucasus region. So this event, along with the suspicion of the Turks over the Armenians, they made the Turkish government to push for removal of Armenians from the war zones along the Eastern Front. And after this, on April 24, 1915, the killing of Armenian people began. It is said that around 15 lakh Armenians have been killed during the First World War by the Ottoman talks. That is, when the Ottomans got defeated by Russians in 1915, they blamed the Armenians for the setback and they accused Armenians of treachery. So as a result, they unleashed the military forces on Armenian villages and many thousands of Armenians were killed and were forcibly removed from their houses at Eastern Anatolia to the Syrian deserts. Anatolia refers to modern-day Turkey, which is the peninsula of land that today constitutes the Asian portion of Turkey. It is also called as Asia Minor. So we just saw the process in which many Armenians lost their lives. Now coming to the present, recently on April 24th, US President commemorated the 106th anniversary of mass killing of Armenians by twice calling it as a genocide. And when we say genocide, it refers to deliberate killing of section of people from a particular nation or a region with the aim of destroying that section or group of people. Though the remark made by the US president fulfilled long pending American promise, move has infuriated Turkey. And Turkish foreign minister immediately issued a statement saying that the US has opened a deep wound that undermines mutual trust and friendship. Know that though Turkey acknowledges the atrocities that were committed against Armenians at that point of time, still it refuses to call it as a genocide as Turkey considers it to be an insult on the Turks if they call it as a genocide. See, already the US-Turkey relationship is facing a steady decline. For example, in 2016, Turkey accused US-based Turkish Islamic preacher for being the mastermind of a failed coup. Therefore, it asked the U.S. government to hand him over to Turkey. But U.S. did not pay any attention to the demand 
then Turkey decided to buy S-400 missile defense system from Russia despite strong opposition from the United States. And as a result, this led to US to remove Turkey from the F-35 fighter jet training program and also to impose sanctions on Turkey. So it is amidst these situations, the current announcement made by Mr. Biden on the Armenian killings has come and it has further widened the gap between the two countries. And according to Turkey, calling the Armenian massacre as a genocide does no good in foreign policy. So the author in this article concludes that Turkey should not live in denial of the atrocities committed against Armenians. At the same time, care should be taken to prevent the past incidents in ruining the present relationships. However, end of the day, provided Turkey and US are in good terms, would US president call the massacre that happened at that time as a genocide is really a question. So these are some of the aspects with reference to the analysis of this news article. In this analysis, we discussed about the Armenian killings, the Turkey's stand on the issue, implications on the declining US-Turkey relationship. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. This news article was written by Saudi Arabia's ambassador to India. He lists out the initi initiatives taken by Saudi so as to build a climate-resilient global economy for the future. Let us discuss these aspects in detail. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, the author talks about two recent initiatives that are launched by Saudi's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman so as to combat the threat of climate change. Now, they include Saudi Green Initiative. Then another initiative is Middle East Green Initiative. If you take Middle East Green Initiative, it aims to plant 50 billion trees. Of this, around 40 billion trees or 80% will be planted in the West Asian region. Now, this represents 5% of the global target of planting 1 trillion trees and also to reduce 2.5% of global carbon levels. It also aims to reduce carbon emissions that come from hydrocarbon production in the region by 60%. At the global scale, it aims to reduce the carbon emissions by 10%. So in this regard, the Saudi Crown Prince has called the leaders of Qatar, Iran, Sudan, Kuwait, Bahrain and other countries to partner this project. In partnership with participating countries, they are planning to arrive at innovative methods to irrigate the terrains. Here know that research will be done to use treated water for irrigation, cloud seeding and others. Research will also be done on purpose-driven solutions like planting native trees, that require support for three years to grow and these trees will then be able to survive on their own with natural irrigation. So these are some information about Middle East Green Initiative. Now let's come to Saudi Green Initiative. Now the aim of this initiative is to transform Saudi from one of the world's top oil producers into a global leader in forging a greener world. Remember this is part of Saudi's efforts to diversify the economy away from its oil dependence. And in this regard, it aims to raise vegetation cover, address land degradation, preserve marine life and also to reduce carbon emissions. Under this initiative, within the Saudi Kingdom, 10 billion trees will be planted in the coming years. And with this, the Kingdom will contribute to raising the percentage of the protected area to more than 30% of its total land area. And under this initiative, the government will also work towards reducing carbon emissions by more than 4% of global contributions. This will be achieved by adopting a renewable energy program that will generate 50% of Saudi's energy from renewables by the year 2030. So this is about Green Middle East Initiative and Green Saudi Initiative. Now, the author also talks about other global collaborations of Saudi Arabia with respect to climate change mitigation initiatives. First, he talks about the G20 presidency of Saudi. See, Saudi assumed the presidency of G20 in December 2019 for a period of one year or for a one-year term. And know that it was the first Arab nation to assume the G20 presidency. Here Arthur tells that one of the main pillars of Saudi G20 presidency was to safeguard the planet. And in this regard, the G20 introduced many initiatives under the presidency of Saudi. One is establishing of a global coral reef research and development accelerator platform. 
Now the purpose of this platform is to accelerate scientific knowledge and technology development in support of coral reef survival, conservation, resilience, adaptation and restoration. Another initiative under the presidency of Saudi in G20 is the acknowledgement of circular carbon economy platform. See circular carbon economy is an integrated and inclusive approach to transition towards more comprehensive, resilient, sustainable, climate-friendly energy systems. These systems will support and enable sustainable development. We will see how this is possible. This circular carbon economy, it enables countries to take advantage of all technologies, forms of energy and mitigation opportunities as per the resource availability, economical feasibility and national circumstances. The concept builds on the principles of circular economy and applies them to manage carbon emissions. How is this done? See, it aims to reduce the carbon that must be managed at the first place. Then it aims to reuse carbon as an input to create feedstocks and fuels. Then it aims to recycle carbon through the natural carbon cycle with bioenergy. Then it aims to remove excess carbon and store it. So, with regard to achieving the targets of circular carbon economy, the author notes that Saudi Arabia currently operates the largest carbon capture and utilization plant in the world. And this helps in turning half a million tons of carbon dioxide annually into products like fertilizers and methanol. Saudi also operates one of the region's most advanced carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery plants that capture and store 8 lakh tons of carbon dioxide annually. Now secondly, the author talks about Saudi's partnership with India. See, it should be remembered that Saudi is already collaborating with India in many renewable energy projects. It joined with India and in the International Solar Alliance. It also signed several MOUs and agreements in key sectors, including renewable energy. In this regard, author praises India's remarkable commitments to tackle climate change and to achieve its Paris Agreement targets, that are the INDCs. He notes that India's renewable energy capacity is the fourth largest in the world, where India has an ambitious target of achieving 450 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by the year 2030. So this is about what other has to say with reference to India. So the conclusion goes like the launch of Saudi Green Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative would provide a momentum so that all countries can come together to unify their efforts to combat climate change and to save the planet and to save a lot of small island developing states. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this editorial article. In this analysis, we discussed about Saudi Green Initiative, Middle East Green Initiative. We saw the contributions of Saudi Arabia during its presidency of G20. Then we saw a brief or a general version about Saudi's partnership with India, particularly at the renewable energy front. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is about the approval of a new antibody based therapeutic product for COVID-19 for clinical trial. The name of the new product is Wincov-19. See, it is a collaborative effort of Wins Bioproducts Limited, the University of Hyderabad, then CSIR Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. It got approval from the Drugs Controller General of India for clinical trials so as to test against COVID-19 disease. In this context, let us know about the antibody product Winco 19 and also about DGCA, that is the Drugs Controller General of India. Now, to understand Winco 19, we should first know how antibodies are used in treatment of diseases like COVID. See, body's immune system generates antibodies as a defense mechanism against unfamiliar foreign molecules. The scientific term for such unfamiliar molecules is antigens. Molecules from bacteria and viruses, they can act as antigens and they will prompt the production of antibodies in our bodies. These antibodies, they bind to antigen and neutralize them. Same is the case with COVID as well. Here, coronavirus is the antigen. The bodies of majority of people who recover from COVID-19, they produce antibodies to the SARS coronavirus 2 virus. And scientists have found that these antibodies, they persist for at least 5 to 7 months after the infection. So from these individuals, these antibodies can be utilized to treat yet to recover patients. And this kind of treatment is nothing but the convalescent plasma therapy. 
However, scientists can also produce these antibodies in a laboratory setting as well, so that they can be infused into the blood. These are called monoclonal antibody therapy. Here they use a technology called as recombinant DNA technology. But before the coming of recombinant DNA technology that produces antibody in labs, animals were used to make antibodies, mainly the horses and goats. How see the antigen is injected into these animals and their bodies are allowed to make antibodies. The antibodies are then filtered out and used for treatment in patients. In a similar fashion, Winco-19 is an antibody product that is obtained after the immunization of horses with inactivated SARS coronavirus 2 virus. The antibodies that are triggered in the horses are purified and further processed to generate highly pure antibody based product. It is found that these antibodies could block the attachment of the new coronavirus to the lung cells. So they are saying that the antibodies can provide maximum benefit if it is administered at the early stages of the disease before the lung consolidation. So this is the specialty about this WinCo-19. The news article states that for the purposes of clinical trial, the Drugs Controller General of India has approved this antibody based product. So let us have a brief look on this office which is the head of department of Central Drugs Standard Control Organization of Government of India. Its headquarters is in Delhi. This office is responsible for the approval of licenses for specified categories of drugs like blood and blood products, IV fluids, vaccines. All right. Drugs controller also sets standards for manufacturing, sales, import and distribution of drugs in our country. It implements the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940 and the Rules 1945. The office comes under Ministry of Health. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. In the analysis we saw about antibodies, convalescent plasma therapy, antibody treatment, WinCo-19 and also about Drugs Controller General of India. Now let's move on to next news article. Now this news article talks about the Asian Development Bank's forecast on India's growth for 2021-2022. According to the forecast, India's growth in 2021-22 is raised to 11% from its earlier forecasts of 8%. In this light, let us discuss in brief about Asian Development Bank. See, this bank was established in 1966 at the capital of Philippines, Manila. There were 31 founding members and currently the membership is 68. Of these 68 members, 49 are within Asia and the Pacific. The remaining 19 members are from outside. See, India is one of its regional and founding members. The objective of the bank is to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient and a sustainable Asia and the Pacific while sustaining the efforts to eradicate extreme poverty. In this regard, it assists its members and partners by providing loans, technical assistance, grants, equity investments, so as to promote social and economic development. Now coming to the organization, the highest policy making body is the Board of Governors. It comprises of one representative from each member nation. Note that the ADB Charter or the agreement that provided for the establishment of Asian Development Bank, it vests all the powers of the institution over this Board of Governors and they meet formally once a year during the annual meeting of ADB. These governors, they will elect 12 members so as to form a board of directors. It is this board of directors who will perform their duties full time at the ADB headquarters. The bank also has a management team. It is headed by the bank's president. It also consists of managing director general and six vice presidents. It is this team that supervises the works of Asian Development Bank's operational, administrative and knowledge departments. As we saw earlier, the shareholders of Asian Development Bank consist of 49 countries in the Asia and the Pacific and 19 countries from outside the region. As per 31 December 2019, the five largest shareholders of Asian Development Bank were Japan and United States, each with 15.6% of total shares, followed by China with 6.4%, then India with 6.3% and finally Australia with 5.8%. These are five largest shareholders. And when you take the support of ADB to India, it aims to accelerate economic transformation by building industrial competitiveness, creating jobs, accelerating growth of low-income states and in addressing environmental and climate change challenges. 
So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article wherein we saw about Asian Development Bank. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. This news article is a data point that talks about the global military spending in 2020. The data was acquired from a report released by CIPRI, which is the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. The report is titled as Trends in World's Military Expenditure. Now, the report states that world military expenditure in 2020 is estimated to have been around 1981 billion and it is the highest level since the year 1988. This huge military spending has been seen despite the huge financial burden that is incurred to most of the countries because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the report states that the world military expenditure in 2020 was 2.6% higher in real times than that of 2019. As a share of global gross domestic product, the military burden, it rose by 0.2 percentage points. So now it is at 2.4 percent of global GDP. Coming to five biggest spenders in 2020, United States, China, India, Russia and the United Kingdom. These five countries account for 62 percent of world military spending. US military expenditure grew by 4.4 percent in 2020. China grew by 1.9%, India by 2.1%, Russia by 2.5% and UK by 2.9%. India's military spending in 2020 was 2.9% of GDP and 9.1% of our government spending. And India's military spending as a share of GDP and as a share of total government spending among comparable economies is second only to Russia. Even among BRICS, India spending as a share of GDP and government spending was second highest. Now, coming to continent wise, in 2020, military expenditure increased in Africa at 5.1%, Europe at 4%, Americas at 3.9%, Asia and Oceania at 2.5%. But the total military expenditure of 11 countries in the Middle East decreased by 6.5%. Now, talking about military burden, it increased across all regions in 2020. The military burden was an average of 1.5% of GDP for countries in the Americas, 1.8% for Africa, Asia and Oceania and Europe and 4.9% for the countries in the Middle East. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article which talks about findings from a report titled as Trends in World's Military Expenditure released by Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. We have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. See this question with reference to Asian Development Bank. Three statements are given. They are asking which of the statements given above are correct. The Asian Development Outlook is an annual publication of Asian Development Bank. This statement is correct. The outlook analyzes the economic and development issues in developing countries in Asia. This includes forecasting inflation, GDP growth rates in this region including China and also of India. First statement is correct. It has members only from the Asia and Pacific region. Now, this statement is incorrect. It includes even members from outside. Right now, there are around 68 members. 49 are from Asia and Pacific region. Remaining 19 members are from outside. So, second statement is incorrect. Third statement, India is one of its founding members. It is correct. It is also its regional member. And as per December 2019 estimations, India is also one among the five largest shareholders of Asian Development Bank. Correct answer, option C, 1 and 3 only. Recently, Ufaya Thosagarensis was seen in news. This refers to what? New eel species discovered in West Bengal, new flower species discovered in Northeast India, new damselfly species discovered in Western Ghats, new frog species discovered in South India. See, the correct answer is option C. It is a new damselfly species discovered in Western Ghats. Another damselfly species that was discovered was Ufaya pseudodispar. Wincove 19 that is recently seen in news is a ventilator designed by National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, vaccine manufactured by Serum Institute of India, antibody therapy approved for clinical trial, oxygen concentrator made by Baba Atomic Research Center. Correct answer is option C. See this question. Consider the following statements with reference to the report Trends in World's Military Expenditure in 2020. See, this report was released by Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Which of the above statements are correct? The world military expenditure increased in 2020 compared to 2019. This statement is correct. 
India was among the five biggest military spenders in 2020. This statement is also correct. Therefore, the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Mines questions for your practice have been given here. You may write your answer and post it in the comment section for peer review. With this, we come to the end of today's The Hindu News Analysis. If you like the video, click the like button, comment, share and subscribe to Shankar A's Academy YouTube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation.